Hello, fellow Democrats, futurists, and problem solvers. This is After the Oligarchy. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Philip Daprich. Philip Daprich is a political economist and philosopher working at the Free University Berlin. His PhD was entitled Rationality and Distribution in the Socialist Economy. And today, we'll be discussing his work on refining the model of economic planning, first proposed by Cockshot and Cottrell in Towards a New Socialism. Today's conversation is in association with META, the Center for Post-Capitalist Civilization. If you're not familiar with Towards a New socialism you can buy the book or find a free pdf online you can also find interviews with paul cockshot on this channel and i'll put links in the description to philip daprick's doctoral thesis as well as a relevant paper so philip daprick thank you very much for joining me thank you very much for this conversation So before we begin with the questions, I was talking to Paul Cockshot yesterday and he mentioned that actually you, Paul Cockshot and Alan Cottrell have finished a book, a new book on economic planning called Economic Planning in an Age of Environmental Crisis. And that's just with the publishers now and it's going to come out sometime this year. So just want to say a few words about that? Yeah. So what we're trying to do in, in, in this book are two things. First of all, we want to demonstrate that you need some kind of economic planning in order to tackle the sort of huge task of transforming the economy away from fossil fuels. Paul Cockshot actually did a calculation for the book of the investment that would be necessary in the UK as an example country to sort of completely transform the energy system. And the amount of investment that is needed actually exceeds the total private investment in the UK, the, the annual total private investment in the UK. So if that's correct, then there's no way that private investment alone will be able to tackle this and you need the state to step in and uh, and and take a significant role in this the second thing that we are we're doing is showing how economic planning techniques can be applied precisely to this problem of transforming an economy towards a completely different energy source. So, so one of the things that we've looked at is how, how sort of you can do sort of long-term plans that gradually sort of transform the economy or the basis of the economy. And the other thing, which is uh, something that I worked on in my PhD thesis as well, is to look at how we can consider environmental constraints in planning and also in valuation of goods. And just one more thing on that. So it's a book primarily about long-term planning and about applying that to the environment, or will there be material about relating a long-term plan to say a yearly plan? The, the techniques we describe are of course sort of generally applicable uh, for long-term planning and they could be applied to sort of any, any kind of long-term objective that you might have. But what we're arguing in the book is that this would be particularly relevant when you're trying to sort of drastically change the way that the economy is structured and the way that production, especially of, of electricity and energy is done. Yeah. Well, it sounds like it'll be very interesting and I'll make sure to get a copy when that is released. But our conversation today is about something else. It's about your work on introducing opportunity cost valuations into the towards a new socialism model. But before we get into what new te techniques and methods you, you introduced, I'd like to just situate that in the history of this problem and also just a bit about towards a new socialism. So in terms of giving background to viewers, can you frame the issue of economic calculation so viewers can understand why the issue of opportunity cost is important and we can go on from there. Right. So generally speaking, in a socialist economy, um, a similar problem applies as in any other economy, which is how to apportion resources, labor, the means of production towards various uses. How much labor are we going to use to produce food versus energy versus other things? And you want to do that in a way that's in some sense efficient. And there are techniques to do that. There are optimal planning techniques that, that, that can be used to do that. But what they can't necessarily tell you is which kinds of products are needed, right? Do we need more food? Do we need more laptops? Do we need more smartphones, right? And they can't really tell you that. So in a sense, there's still a choice that has to be made by individual consumers or, or planners on what kinds of things to produce. And obviously, one thing that will factor into that is the usefulness of these products, right? So if we decide how many laptops are we going to produce, we'll have to take into account, well, how useful are more laptops going to be? But of course, you also need, on the other hand, to consider what is 
the cost of producing these laptops. And I think that cost should be understood as an anti cost. So basically, when you use resources to produce laptops, you can no longer use these resources to produce other things. Labor that is used in factories to assemble laptops is labor that can't be used to produce smartphones instead or food or something else, right? So that is really what is meant by opportunity cost is the opportunities that are lost when we're doing something. When we're use, dedicating resources to the production of laptops, we can't use these resources for something else. And that is the opportunity that's being lost. And the difficult thing is trying to sort of capture that in a, in a way that can be measured, right? That you have sort of a single scale that would tell you what is the opportunity cost of a laptop versus a smartphone versus something else. So just to clarify, you're saying that in, in the context of socialism and socialist planning, there are techniques of optimizing a plan, which given the products and the resources that exist today, can distribute that in an efficient manner. But that is different from saying next year, how should that kind of list of ingredients so uh, and, and products? Mm -hmm. So when you're optimizing in mathematics, that always means maximizing some function, right? And what we're trying, what we're maximizing is the product output, right? But of course, you have many different kinds of products, laptops, smartphones, food, and so on. And the way that, that we deal with this is by fixing proportions of these products. So we're saying, well, we're going to produce um, two smartphones for every laptop and for so and so many units of food and so on, right? So, so you have set proportions, and then we maximize the output at these proportions. But of course, you don't just want to choose any arbitrary proportions because uh, you want that to reflect the actual need for laptops and smartphones and food and so on. So you have to adjust these proportions to the actual needs. And this is where opportunity cost plays a role, because when you're then deciding, well, should we maybe increase the production of laptops relative to smartphones, then um, one of the factors besides the usefulness of laptops and smartphones that you have to take into account is, well, how many more smartphones could we produce instead of one laptop? That's the opportunity cost, right? What what other things can we not produce if we produce one laptop? All right, so let, let's introduce towards a new socialism because so far we've been talking about economic planning in general, central planning in general, but towards a new socialism is a particular model which does things in a particular way. And you're decided to take that model and to refine aspects of that. Yeah. So. What I found sort of the most significant contribution of towards the new socialism and, and what made me want to sort of work on this model and, and confine it is that it has this automatic feedback loop, which continually adjusts sort of the mix of products being produced in response to consumer demand. So if there's a high consumer demand for uh, laptops, then we'll increase the production of laptops. And the way that this works is that, well, first of all, you regulate the prices. So these are token prices in terms of labor vouchers rather than money prices, but we can put that sort of difference uh, aside for now. You adjust the prices towards the market clearing rates of products. So these market clearing rates are basically the rates at which the supply and the demand for a product match. We're currently producing 1000 laptops a month and there's demand for 1000 laptops a month at the current price. That's when you have market clearing rates. And then these prices give you a good idea of sort of how much are people willing to pay for these laptops. And that could be used sort of as a proxy for how useful they find these laptops and how important these laptops are to their lives. And then the idea is, well, if the price is very high, then people are willing to pay a lot for it. And then maybe that justifies producing more laptops in the future because, because people really value them. Um, while if the prices, the, the clearing prices are really low, that means people aren't actually willing to pay that much for that many laptops. And maybe we should be producing less in the future. But the question now becomes the price is high or low relative to what? You need some kind of standard of comparison. And that will be different for a laptop than for an Apple because a laptop takes significantly more resources, different kinds of resources, but generally more resources, it's more expensive in some sense to produce. Right. You're, you're talking about comparing the price that it sells to the cost of, of, producing. of producing it. And, and it's then a question of how do you find, define that cost? 
Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And what the towards the new socialism model does is measure the cost of producing an item in terms of the labor time, the socially average labor time that is necessary to produce it. So this goes back to Marx's labor theory of value, which is a theory of prices under capitalism, but which now sort of applies this to socialism and says, well, this is also an adequate measure of cost of the cost of producing items under socialism. And a problem that many people have with this, and I think there's, uh, there's certainly some truth to it, is that you're only considering one factor that is necessary to produce an item, labor. And you're ignoring other factors, you're ignoring the machine machinery that is needed for it. Not entirely, because machines take labor to produce, right? So you could say labor factors in, into that as well. But you're certainly ignoring things like fertile land, which is scarce and which can't be produced by labor. And what I was particularly interested in, in my thesis is that you're ignoring environmental cost. So um, the way that I consider this in my thesis is, is, is I think we should introduce uh, some kind of cap on the emission of greenhouse gases. And then when you cap the emission rights for greenhouse gases, these emission rights become a scarce resource that needs to be economized on. And I think the amount of emissions that the production of a product takes then have to be factored into the cost of that product as well. Let's address that last example. And I'm going to put myself in the position of somebody defending, who's advocating for the towards any socialism model without these modifications. And, and a person might say, okay, but given that the plan as it's, and, and just, I think it is clear, but just for viewers, the plan that we're talking about is it's a comprehensive plan for producing all the goods and services for the economy. So everything that appears in, in the shops, what uh, resources and input go to what production units, uh, projects are, are what they're called in towards the new socialism. So surely, say in the case of carbon emissions, we could decide what our limit for carbon is going to be for this year or the next 10 years. And then we just use that, set that as a constraint. And we just make sure that the plan doesn't exceed that constraint. Just to make this completely concrete, let's say there's a billion tonne CO2 equivalent that's allowed this year. And so as long as all of the production that happens this year does not produce more than 1 billion tonne CO2 equivalent, it's fine. So what do you think are the limitations of that? Yeah, so I mean, this, this absolutely works. And you can, even in, in sort of the original towards a new socialism model, you can introduce a constraint on emissions and that will make sure that the optimized plan that you calculate in the end doesn't violate these constraints towards whatever environmental limits that you think are necessary. The problem, I think, is that it will lead to an inadequate measure of the cost of individual products, which will then lead to an inadequate sort of mix of products being produced with an overemphasis on products which actually take a lot of these scarce emission rights, which then means other things can't be produced anymore. For example, the cost of fuel, diesel fuel, for example, for, for cars or, or petrol for cars would be quite low uh, or would represent maybe the labor cost of producing that fuel, but wouldn't take into account that actually, you know, by burning this fuel, you're emitting quite a lot of greenhouse gases. That means that there would be no incentive to sort of say, okay, well, this is actually what's using up all our emission ri rights right now. Let's drastically reduce that and maybe even increase production of other things, which instead, which uh, don't take up that many emission rights, right? So that's the problem. The problem is not that you'll get a plan that then emits too much CO2. The problem is that we'll be using all of our scarce emission rights to produce things which maybe we shouldn't be producing. Uh, and we should use those emission rights to produce a lot more of other things, which only take sort of a tiny fraction of that, of those emission rights. Yeah. So let me recap that. And then I'm going to ask you another question as a devil's advocate. If I am correct, what you're saying is that there are really two problems here. There's an absolute and there's a relative problem. The absolute problem is how in absolute terms can we make sure that we do not exceed 1 billion tons CO2 equivalent? But there's a second problem as well. And that problem is given that we don't want to exceed that limit, how are we going to distribute these resources the most effectively, the most efficiently with the greatest social benefit or however you want to phrase it? Exactly. Once we've decided to limit carbon emissions, these they are a scarce resource and we have to decide how do we want to use those resources, right? 
And maybe using all of it on, on car fuel isn't the best way to use these scarce resources, right? Maybe other things where each sort of unit takes less of these scarce emission rights would be a much, much better way to go about it. And because this isn't reflected in, in, in the labor value costing of, of these products, if you simply use labor values, I don't think that's the result you will get. I actually showed this in a, in a computer simulation for a couple of small sample economies. And I got some, some results that sort of, I, I wasn't expecting, but generally what you got was that in the labor value model, what happens is that you simply to re, to, to stay within the emission constraint, you simply produce less overall, right? Or sometimes in, in, in some really strange cases, you even produce more of the environmentally destructive goods. But in my model, generally what you got is to see a reduction in production to stay within the emission constraint. But you saw a shift. You saw more relative production of environmentally friendly goods, while you saw a significant reduction in the kinds of goods that were actually contributing to, to carbon emissions, because this was now reflected in their price and they'd only be produced as long as people would be willing to to pay that higher price. Yeah. We're going to get to your model and we're going to get to your simulations, which are very interesting and important. I'd like to focus on the problem just for a bit, a little bit longer. So just to illustrate this issue of staying within the absolute limit, but maybe not solving the relative problem. And we could think about that in other cases, which would be even more intuitive. Okay. And I'll, I'm going to give a, a very stupid example, although it's not really because it's kind of how the world actually works at the moment. So let's say we've got a finite water supply or a finite supply of uh, grain. And you might say, OK, well, there are uh, 300 million tons of grain. We just don't have more. We don't have enough arable land or whatever. So an economy could produce that, in, uh, distribute that in two, two different ways. One way is that they could make sure that everybody has a nutritious supply of grain. And the another way is that all of the grain could go to one person and everybody else could starve. And both of these don't uh, use up more grain than there is. And so I just wanted to give that to make it really clear. And what I'm saying is that's a, a stupid example, but actually that is really <laughs> pretty much how the world works today. And that's actually, it's one of the great problems of capitalism. So if we don't over, if, you know, we can call a system socialism, but if we don't overcome that problem, in socialism, then that the problem still exists. Okay, you've made the point clear, but I, I really just want to drill into that just a little bit more. One more question. So somebody advocating towards new socialism as it is, they might say, okay, you know, what you're saying is true, but what if we set a long term plan for a gradual decrease of these carbon emissions? You know, I, this year it's 1 billion tons CO2 equivalent, but let's say in 10 or 15 years, it's going to be zero. So people are going to have to figure out how to stop using it effectively. So how do you respond to that? Once you get to sort of zero emissions and you, and, and you basically, so let's say zero emission really means no emissions and not that you're like offsetting it. So there are of course also these ideas that, you know, we're always going to emit some CO2, but we'll have to um, capture the same amount of CO2 back from the air, something like that, right? Yeah. Let's assume that's yeah. not possible and you really have to have zero at that point, you probably don't need this anymore because, or you don't need my, my modification anymore, at least to take into account carbon emissions and costing, because you could simply ban any products with, or, or, or any production methods, which, um, which emit CO2 outright, or you'd have to, because you can't have any of it an, anymore anyways. Right. Um, so at that, at that point, it probably wouldn't make a difference anymore. But even if, if that's what we were going to do and we don't continue to have small emissions because, you know, there are some areas where it's really hard to get rid of these, these emissions. There's, there, because there aren't really any, any feasible alternatives. But even if, if, if we were to get to that at some point, that's still a few years or decades down the road. So in the meantime, we, uh, we will continue to emit some CO2, but we have to drastically reduce that. And then you precisely get these kinds of situations that I'm looking at where you have a constraint on emissions, you still have some emissions, and then the use up of emission rights should be reflected in the cost uh, of an item. There's a trajectory, there's a journey still, and we can't say, well, we're going to get there eventually, so it doesn't matter how inefficient we are in the meantime. And, and the other thing is, and this leads naturally into some more issues that you're trying to address, which is carbon is not the only environmental cost. It's, all, it's actually only one type of environmental cost. It's only one type of natural resource cost, and it's only one type of cost. Like you were saying, there are issues about the opportunity cost of using capital goods, for instance, as well. So even if we got to zero emissions, that wouldn't take care of that. So do you want to just say something about that as well? I mean, first of all, maybe about environmental 
environmental constraints, uh, of course, you can generalize this towards other environmental constraints as well. So we could, as a society, decide not just that we want to limit CO2 emissions, but we could also decide maybe we want to reduce the amount of land that is used for, for agriculture so that we have more land can be used for nat natural reserves or, or, or something like that. And then you could also sort of say, well, okay, no, we're not going to use all available land that we could potentially use for agriculture. We're actually going to reduce the number of hectares that, that, that can be used in the plan uh, for growing food. And then you'd have to sort of use the available land more more um, efficiently and so on. So you could do this on with with any kind of sort of in, environmental con concern, or at least uh, a lot of other environmental concerns as well. Formulate them as some kind of constraint. Introduce them to to the optimization problem that's solved when you calculate an optimal plan. Uh, and then in a similar way, in my model, this would be reflected in the cost of producing these items as well. And then of course this. This is a general approach. It doesn't just apply to these sort of additional environmental constraints that you might introduce, but it also affects other constraints which happen to be there in the economy. For example, if there's limited number of a certain kind of machine available at a time, and it would take perhaps a long time to um, build up the stock of that of that type of machinery, then uh, that is an effective constraint on the economy as well. And that would also be re reflected in, in the cost of, of items, right? Do they need scarce machine they have limited capacity of at the moment to produce? Then they'll probably have a higher opportunity cost. And this will then, then re be reflected in, um, in adjusting the portions of goods that are being produced. Yeah. Hello, this is After the Oligarchy. A quick message. If you're enjoying this, please press the like button. It makes a difference. Don't forget to visit aftertheoligarchy.com to see full transcripts of videos plus other material. And on Twitter, I'm at afteroligarchy if you're into that sort of thing. As we head back to the show now, let's keep our heads cool and our critical thinking sharp. Now back. Let's talk about this issue a bit more. So about the capital goods. This one is a bit different because there is that embodied labor in capital goods and machinery. So what we're talking about in terms of capital goods, you know, people could think about machine in a production line, could think about a building. There are goods that are used to produce other things. They tend to be longer lasting. So in the case of carbon emissions, there's no way really to interpret that in terms of labor. It's just that there's a certain number of carbon emissions and we don't want to go above that. How do we figure out how we use these? But with capital, there is a way to at least partially account for the cost to society of a capital good. And that is how much labor went into A, people actually laboring to assemble it and put it together and B, how much labor was put into the things of which the machine is made. So if the machine, say, has three components, it's got a belt, an engine, and an electronic interface, how much labor went into those things? And then, you know, you can go back and back and back and back and back. That, that's precisely how you would calculate the labor value of, of these machines. And as you say, there's a case to be made that machines can be produced by labor, so they are not as strictly limited as other things might be, right? We can produce more of them. But they might still be limited in the short term. While in the long term, you might be able to sort of build up the stock of machinery. In the short term, you might simply not, not have that many machines and it might take some time to produce more. And maybe this doesn't just apply to individual machines, but to capital stock in general. Um, you can see, and I mean, this is sort of often seen like this in the, in the tradition of the labor theory of value is that capital is in a sense, dead labor. This past labor that was put into machines that was then sort of accumulated and built up over time. And there might be a limit to that as well, not just to individual machines, but to capital stock in general, because only sort of the labor or, or, or the, the portion of, of the value produced by labor that is not immediately used up can even be sort of accumulated as capital stock, right? So there's a limit to the capital stock that we have available at any time. And I think that should be reflected in, in costs as well, because that puts a constraint on what we can produce. To just develop on that a little bit more in terms of what, you know, what does this opportunity cost mean? The way I think about it is, so like you're saying, firstly, by timescales. So we might say, in 50 years, we might have twice as many or three times as many nuclear power stations than we have now. 
or like you're saying, we might have expanded the total capital of stock. Twi- it might be twice as big. But on the time scale of, say, this year, it's essentially fixed. And so the question is then, how do we distribute those capital goods such that they're used the most effectively? And opportunity cost is a way of basically saying how uh, useful is each of these capital goods going to be so that we can make sure that they're distributed in the right way. It's quite a different way to thinking about the labor because that's thinking about how do we optimize the amount of labor that went into these and that it'll save in the future. Whereas this is more about capital goods are scarce and given they're scarce and people want them for different things, how do we distribute them? Exactly. So an example uh, that you might give also to do with sort of ecological transformation is um, electricity generation. So we have a certain amount of power plants running right now that are available right now. And we now have to allocate the electricity that can be produced by the available power plants. We might be able to build more of them in the future, but it takes five years or even longer to build a nuclear power plant. So while this might be might be uh, possible, it doesn't really affect the available electricity that we have right now and that we need to um, allocate right now. Yes, exactly. Okay, so we've given the contours of the problem. We've talked about opportunity cost and planning and optimizing and labor costs. So let's look at what could be the solutions. So you've talked a bit about that already. So how did you attempt to solve this problem? So the difficulty is finding sort of a common denominator, common unit in which to measure the opportunity cost. And there's a way to do it, which is sort of known in the linear optimization literature. It's, uh, it's called shadow pricing. And the basic idea of, of shadow pricing is that you make a slight change to one of the constraints of an optimization problem and then see how much does this change the value of the optimized objective function which you're trying to maximize that's sort of in in very general terms the way that i applied this then to calculate the opportunity cost of consumer products which is what i was mostly interested in is i postulated so to say that you get one unit of the product for free so let's say we had one unit of bread for free i do this by introducing a a free bread method, which is a, is a method of magically producing one unit of bread um, without using any labor, any resources, any energy, and no emission rights, and so on, right? It just magically appears. But this method can only be used once, so you can only produce one unit like this. And then I looked at, well, one. if I introduce this method and we get this one unit for free, we can then use those resources which would otherwise have been needed to produce that unit of bread to produce other things. And that will lead to a slight increase in, in the overall production and in, in the value of the objective function. So, so you, have, you, you have overall a bit more because you get one unit of free for free. But this is now measured in some other quantity. It could be, the, could be a quantity of some other product, which I call the objective product. But generally, you see the slight increase. And this increase is then used as the value of the product um, or the relative cost value of, of, of a product. So just before we go into that, I just want to say that there's this paper, Optimal Planning with Consumer Feedback, a Simulation of a Socialist Economy, and that's linked in the description. And that goes through all of this in the full technical details. There will be people who who will want to read through that. So that's there for them, if I can recap this. So what you're saying is that we are producing all of these different goods and we're looking at, let's say, if we take one of them, if we take bread, what would happen if one unit of bread appeared without requiring any inputs? And so... Yeah. So I, I think one, one intuition that, that some people might have, might, might have, and I had this, uh, I've had this question posed at me at first is, well, isn't what you have more than simply one unit of bread, right? So the value of one unit of bread is one unit of bread. That doesn't tell you a lot. But what you actually might is, you might say, well, we don't actually need one more unit of bread, right? Maybe we want to use some of the resources, which we now don't need to produce this unit of bread to produce other things as well. So you, you produce a bit more of everything, basically, with those resources. And um, this then increases the production of all things at the proportions which are set by what we call the plant target. So the plant target is what sets the proportions of uh, various various products, right? So can I come in on that just, just to clarify? So what, what you're really saying is you're introducing one unit of bread for free. So that means that it really the way it works is that means there's one unit of bread 
that you don't have to make. Yeah. And all of the stuff that would have gone into producing that one unit of bread now can go to everything else. All of the flour, the electricity to heat up the ovens, the labor and so forth. Now that we've gotten that free unit of bread, this can go elsewhere. And so you're, say, you're seeing what is the effect of using those inputs elsewhere? Is it better? Is it worse? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it will be better, be better for sure, because you have additional resources available. Well, so you can, yes. you can produce more. The question yes. is how much more, right? Yeah. And so, so since, since, the, since we still assume that these proportions are fixed, you'll produce a bit more of everything. And that means you'll produce a bit more bread, right? You'll have a bit more bread in the end. Um, not a full unit, but some small fraction of it, right? But you'll also have a bit more of everything else. And that, that increase can then be sort of measured and, and used as, as a unit of value. Yeah. You're talking about optimizing and you're saying that whenever you're optimizing, you're always trying to maximize or minimize some objective function. So in terms of explaining that, you know, an objective function could be dollars. It could be labor hours. It could be megawatt hours. It could be anything. So in the case of, of your simulations and, and modeling, what is the objective function? How do you decide what the effect of this free unit of bread is? I choose an arbitrary consumer product, which I call the objective product. And some of the examples that I run the simulation on, uh, this was grain. And, and I basically measure the output of grain that is being produced. Then you could ask, well, why grain? Why not any other unit? And the answer is it, doesn't, it really doesn't matter because the proportions of these products are fixed. So you're producing let's say seven unit of coals for every six units of grain. And then if you increase, if you increase the production of corn, you also have to increase the production of coal and so on. So in the end, it doesn't matter which one you use. So um, you, you're just trying to maximize the production of any one product, but because the proportions are fixed, that will also maximize the production of all the other products as well. It's like there's a recipe and we know that in order to make, you know, one serving of falafel, you need to have one tin of chickpeas, you know, one uh, head of garlic and one uh, bundle of parsley or yeah, let's say two. OK, so then, you know, if you want to, if you're going to increase the number of tins of, of chickpeas, well, then the others will go up accordingly. It's, it's fixed. And, yes. and I suppose somebody might ask, Okay, but you know why are these proportions fixed? Surely they should vary. And I'm I'm wondering, is that just because this is you know it's it's a marginal unit? It's just changing for one, so you can tr approximate it as fixed. Is that the answer? Well, I mean, it it is fixed only so for the purpose of calculating one production plan, but then it get gets continually adjusted, and that's I think precisely sort of the interesting thing here is that you have this automatic feedback loop that then the proportions. Uh, for the next planning period will get adjusted depending on the observed behavior of consumers and the observed demand of consumers, right? So you fix it sort of for, for one moment in time, so to say, but then you continually adjust it uh, and, and for, for future production periods, yeah. Let's recap quickly and then we go to how does this, how does this apply to environmental costs? You're saying we introduce our free uh, unit of bread we see how the thing, the inputs that would have gone into making that would be distributed to other products. And then we ask, what does our objective product, what does essentially any product, how much output? So let's say it could be grain, it could be iron. How much does that go up? And you're saying, well, why that? It's because there's a recipe. So you can use any of these goods as a representative for how much does production increase? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's look at now, how did you use this to incorporate environmental costs efficiently into the model? Yeah. So you have a constraint on, on emissions. These emission rights are then scarce. And that means whenever you calculate the value of a product by pretending that you get one unit for free, that means you don't have to use all the resources needed to produce it. And it also means you don't need to use the emission rights needed to produce it. And these emission rights are then freed up to be used to produce other things as well. The emission rights that get used up in the production of a product are, are now reflected in the cost as well. A product that uses up a lot of emission rights, when you get one unit of it for free, 
You have loads of emission rights to work with and uh, you'll be able to produce a lot more with that. And that's why it will have a higher cost in the end. And um, and this will then be reflected in how production gets adjusted and so on. You're able to incorporate the environmental cost in like you would, how much flour it takes or electricity it takes to, to make the bread. And then the question is, well, we introduced the free unit of bread and, and the question is really, you know, how efficient is it to use those carbon emissions or to, to create those carbon emissions from making a unit of bread? How much would production increase if it was used elsewhere? And so that that's the way that we can actually figure out uh, what's an efficient way to use. Uh, and what, what is an efficient production plan with respect to distributing emissions? In one sense, you already have an efficient production plan simply because you calculate an optimal plan. You can do that anyways, and even the labor value model does it. I guess the sense of efficiency that you get in my model that I think you don't properly get in the labor value model is an efficiency in terms of actually producing the things using sort of limited emission rights, which I actually sort of needed the most or, or I have the, mo have the most benefit in some sense. That's where you get the difference. Just out of interest, so if the constraint is set at 1 billion tons uh, CO2 equivalent for that year, does that mean that the plan will always use up that much or could it actually use less using your method? It could use less. Um, so there are constraints which are not effective constraints. Uh, I mean, this doesn't have just have to apply to mission rights, but let's say we have a million hours of, of labor time available to produce things, um, but we only have a limited number of machines or raw materials, then we won't be able to actually use all, all of that labor, right? Because we don't have the tools, the machines, the, the raw materials to do that. And in that, in that case, labor wouldn't be an effective constraint. You'd, you'd still introduce it as a constraint of the problem, but it wouldn't really matter because you can't use that much labor anyways because you don't have all the other ingredients needed. And the same can be true for emission rights. So it could be the case that maybe labor is the effective constraint on production, or there could be multiple effective constraints on production, but maybe emission rights isn't one of them. And then you actually don't use up all of these emission rights. And in that case, you might as well not have introduced the constraint at all because it, it, it's not effective it doesn't it doesn't do anything i mean you could still do it for because you don't necessarily know whether it's going to be an effective constraint or not in chemistry terms this is called the limiting reagent yes coming back to our falafel you know you could have 300 million tons of, of chickpeas but if you've only got two bundles of parsley exactly you're only going to make one serving that's for environmental costs so let's look at, at capital goods how can the opportunity cost of capital goods be introduced to the a new socialism model along these lines this works in, in just the same way so if you have a product that uses a lot of sort of scarce machinery or capital goods to produce right when you get one unit of it for free suddenly all that machine capacity that that would otherwise have been needed to produce that unit is free uh, to produce other things and uh, that then means that uh, you'd be able to produce a lot more uh, with that than if you had another product for free which maybe takes the same amount of labor, but doesn't use as much machine capacity that wouldn't allow you to produce that much more. And that's how you get the difference in, in cost in the final products then, depending on how much um, capital goods are required to produce them. Okay, so you're looking at the capital goods that are used for, say, to make bread, and that's treated as another input. So you might have flour, water, electricity, ovens, and it might use three big industrial ovens, but it won't use a synchronous generator. And so there's a zero for that and there's a, you know, there's three for the ovens. And so then it's, it's the same thing of if the bread wasn't made, how could those ovens be? In terms of the, the unique qualities, characteristics of capital goods, and this applies to land as well, carbon emissions are a lot more transferable. Like anybody can emit carbon emissions. Yeah. Anybody can use flour. However, a machine might be geographically fixed. So how does that come into it? Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, that, that's probably what, what, what people are going to think now is, well, how do you use an oven that can be used to make bread to produce laptops instead? Doesn't, doesn't really work that way. Right. So this would be relevant when you consider a bit longer time periods than, uh, than, than this. So we, we have a choice. We can't produce all the capital goods we, we would ever want, but we can now choose whether to produce more ovens or more ion plantation devices needed to make computer chips or something like this, right? Then, then, then you have a choice at that point. And at that point, it then becomes relevant whether a product requires a lot of these kinds of capital goods, goods or not. It always depends on, 
on sort of the time period you're looking you're, you're looking at in, in the very short term you might not be able to affect the mix of capital goods you have at all and it might simply be irrelevant you have to you have to work with what you've got so to say right and ovens can only produce bread but in a bit longer time period we might have a choice of which kinds of capital goods to produce and then it does matter. So we'll leave it there. There's still a lot more to talk about. We haven't um, really dug into your simulations yet. And there's also the issue of multiple techniques, multiple production techniques. We haven't um, really dealt with that at, at all yet. That was, that was brilliant. I really, I really enjoyed that. Thank you for, um, for taking the time. Yeah, it was good. I, I, I was surprised that you, uh, you really take the time to sort of dig deep into it and make sure you know people people understand it. that's that's a lot, a lot more detail than I, i've done similar interviews before and i don't think we've gone into that that deep onto to a particular point or anything like that so that's really good yeah that's great i appreciate that that's exactly what i tried to do you know i tried to make a balance but basically with this youtube channel and the kind of blog that is exactly what i'm trying to do it's, it's effectively if we're really going to do this if we're really going to change the world and i know that this is how you feel and think because otherwise you wouldn't be doing this we have to have something that will work and that you can actually apply to the real world beyond some generalities and that means that we need to go into these details yeah, I mean, you're a bit of a strange philosopher uh, <laughs> in terms of, uh, you know, I know you're saying is is multidisciplinary, but um, I never would have expected somebody to mention a proportional controller in a, a philosophy thesis because that's my background is electrical engineering, like, and uh, you know, it's just like I don't know many uh, philosophers who can use uh, uh, LP solve. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so I, I mean, I I started off. Um, studying physics and and philosophy, sort of both okay. in parallel. So that's why I have sort of the mathematical background. And originally, my interest in philosophy was more in like the philosophy of science. I wrote my math thesis in philosophy. I wrote on on uh, the philosophy of quantum physics. So something uh, completely unrelated. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I was always, I mean, I was always a communist and and uh, politically interested. And um, I thought for my PhD, I wanted to do something more relevant, but where I could also sort of use my particular skills. I, I knew I, I, I wanted to go in philosophy. And one of the reasons is that I just have such broad interests and philosophy is like the one discipline where you can, you can do anything really. You can do the philosophy of economics or political philosophy. You can also do philosophy of science. And uh, so you, I knew this would be by the nature of it, an interdisciplinary project. And I got Paul involved. He's a computer scientist, of course. And he was like sort of the primary intellectual inspiration for the project as well. But then because I knew I wanted to do it in philosophy, um, we got a philosopher to be the primary supervisor. Paul was the co-supervisor. And then uh, I don't know how much of the thesis you read. I mean, a lot of it is sort of standard political philosophy as well, or yeah, ethics. Yeah. I deal sort of with, I, I start off with sort of very basic philosophical questions in terms of how to distribute things and and the nature of sort of rational choice and, and these kinds of things, right? So. I ground. I try to ground it in in philosophy, but then I also get to these kind of more technical things. Yeah. No, I like that. I think it's a really nice combination because I probably have a very similar interest to you. I'm really interested in the. Uh, I'm very interested in the philosophy of science in particular, and you know, you know, there's that saying of Richard Feynman that uh, philosophy of science is as useful to scientists as philosophy, as uh, ornithology is to birds. But I don't. I don't agree with him on that. <laughs> I don't agree with him on that, particularly not now when you know where. Anyway. We can maybe talk about that. But a lot of a lot of physicists think like that. Yeah. So when when I when I talk to other other people in physics about a philosophy of science, they're always like, "We don't need philosophers to tell us how to do science." <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, but I mean, clearly there there must be sort of there are ways of doing it wrong and there are ways of doing it right. Yeah. And theorizing about that is leaving the realm of science in in a sense because you're not you're not doing science anymore. You're talking on sort of a meta level about science and then you're basically doing philosophy at that point. So, Yeah, definitely. But I think there, there could be a lot more of that general discussion, which is necessary and important, and then going to, okay, but also we live in a real world and we want to do things. I mean, in terms of philosophy, I'm a pragmatist, you know, as in John Dewey and all this. So ultimately everything for me comes back to, you know, what are we going to do? And so I thought that was great. If, you know, yeah, this is this is what Robert no Nozick said and uh, and so right. forth. And, you know, here are some critiques. But uh, anyway, so uh, I was using LPSolve and uh, basically I figured out how to optimize the production plan. I think, uh, yeah, that, there should be more of that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, All right, look, I, 
I'll let you go. Uh, it's great to talk to you and um, we'll, um, we'll talk again next week. All right? Yeah. All right. I'll see you next week then. Bye-bye. Great. Thank you for watching. If you got anything from this video, then please press the like button, consider subscribing, and if you really enjoyed it, then comment your favourite ice cream, pizza topping, or whatever other generic, boring, unrelated nonsense will appease the algorithm. There's a lot more to come. We'll keep exploring better futures for humanity until we get there. And as always, I want to read your thoughts in the comment section below. This channel has a wonderful audience and there are usually some very interesting comments underneath the video, so let's continue that. That's all for now. Our democratic future lies after the oligarchy.